we're so excited for this session today. Um, our first speaker today is George McKimmon. He's an environmental planner with McKimmon Wakefield, um, which is a company he started about 30 years ago. He also teaches in the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development in Ontario Agricultural College at the University of Guelph. And today his topic is Angus Hills and Ian McCard, Landscape Planning in God's Well. Welcome, George. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this uh, paper to you uh, this morning. And for you to listen to me, I'm not an easy person to listen to, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak to you. I want to begin by saying that I met Angus Hills about 50 years ago, almost to the date. And he appeared at a uh, worship service, prayer and praise session, like the one we just had a few moments ago at uh, York University in a student lounge where I, as a graduate student in environmental studies, was participating with others in a prayer and praise session. I'd never met Angus before, never met him. He didn't know me. All he knew was that I was a student, a grad student in environmental studies. What he did was he asked me to review a paper that he had drafted, which was subsequently uh, published in, in uh, the journal Landscape. The paper was entitled a Philosophical Approach to Landscape Planning. That may sound a bit obtuse, but what he was really talking about was his Christian faith and how he incorporated that faith into landscape planning. Uh, that was, I couldn't do it, uh, provide the review that he was looking for. And, and he was disappointed, and that conversation ended at that point. But I kept the paper, and I kept it to this day. About 10 years later, I was working as an environmental planner for the Niagara Scarpment Commission, helping to draft what became the Niagara Scarpment Plan approved in 1985. And I was responsible with others for the environmental analysis the uh, commission used to prepare that plan. Uh, that's important to, that's a kind of an important linkage and protagonist in the story I want to tell because Angus was asked to lead the planning effort to prepare the Niagara Scarpment Plan, but he declined to do so. At the same time, a couple of, uh, a year or so later, uh, Ian McCard came to the Escarpment. Ian was a kind of a counterpart, American counterpart, landscape architect, highly regarded for his skills in environmental planning and respected, wrote the work with the title Design with Nature. And he was employed by a citizens group to review, peer review, the work that I and others had done preparing the environmental analysis for the Escarpment plan. Ian uh, didn't, had never met Angus, but Angus had attended uh, lectures that Ian had done and was quite offended by some of the things that Angus, Ian had to say about faith and, and the environmental deterioration that we're finding around him. So Angus wrote this paper largely in response to hearing a lecture that was given by Ian, where Ian uh, suggested that Christianity was in part dominion ethic, was in part responsible for environmental deterioration. So I conveyed that message to uh, Ian when I met him, and eventually shared the paper with him at that time. Uh, why review this paper now? I'm going to introduce the third protagonist in this story, and that is the Niagara Scarpment itself. It runs from Tobermory on the Bruce Peninsula to Queenston on the Niagara River opposite uh, uh, New York State. And it's an environmental feature that we prepared the first provincial plan for, which was approved in 85, but it's also a UNESCO <coughs> heritage site as well. In uh, just a few weeks ago at Crawford Lake, Crawford Lake is on the Niagara Scarpment. Uh, scientists have identified, well, let me just step back and say it's a very deep lake, very small. Uh, it's been preserved largely in a conservation area in, in its original state. And because it's so deep, the surface waters don't intermingle with the underlying waters, and that provides a very rich sediment base. Now, you may have read about this in the various papers that you followed. I know it's been reported nationwide, but those who studied the sediment layers suggest that the beginning of the Anthropocene era begins in the early 50s, and they base it on the analysis of, of the sediment layers 
at proper play. I want to evaluate 50 years later Angus's paper using four measures transactions and metaphysics, intimacy, design and form, and agency. Uh, the simplest way to do this would be to take some work that I've done that's comparable to what Angus would have done looking at a, a natural landscape. And, and this is from a, a pedestrian mobility study that we did for the city council. And what we did was we used an urban transect to try to describe the various pedestrian environments that exists from the downtown right through to the rural agricultural area within the municipality of Nemels. I want to take a couple metrics and just describe in a rough sense what Angus is doing when he writes his paper. If you look at the downtown area of the city of Hamilton, you find very short blocks with intersections at, at the various uh, cross sections. And the intersection density is very high. Where intersection densities are very high, there's an association with more walking, simply put. If you go all into the suburban area, into the early uh, suburbs, 1880 to 1900, you still find a fairly high intersection density, but not quite as high because instead of square blocks, you get rectangular blocks, which reduce the number of intersections per square mile or whatever metric you want to use. And, and that's associated with some less walking. They go out into the suburban neighborhoods that have been developed in the 40s and the 50s, where you have large blocks and the street pattern within is perfectly linear, you find that intersection density is much lower again. And again, that's so associated with less walking. That association is roughly equivalent to the kinds of <coughs> inter or transactions that Angus uses in his methodology. And that's going to be kind of the focal point that I want to focus on as we go forward. Intimacy is really a, a measure of, of um, what's your emotional response to problems in the landscape. I want to take a, uh, a few moments to think about that. <coughs> Angus uh, has some rather unusual words that express his intimacy with what he's looking at. Design and form is the other metric. You know, what I've done is presented to you a, a transact. Uh, what Angus would do is he'd take a site and he would take a variable, say, wetness from a dry site to a wet site, and he would compare which trees, species, are better suited along that transect, and he would, from that point, suggest, you know, recommendations of what is prime forestry land as opposed to less forestry land. And it's important to realize that he was the first one doing this, and 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 this was became the basis. His approach became the basis in which the Canadian uh, government did land inventory grading for agriculture, forestry, and all kinds of kinds of uses. So that's I want to just think for a second about whether there are other ways to visualize that. And the last point I want to talk about is agency. Do species and elements of our landscape have agency before God with us in the landscapes in which we live. Who is Angus Hills? In the early 70s, Angus Hills was uh, considered to be one of the three prime environmental ecological planners for the planet. And he shared that role with Philip Lewis and with Angus uh, with Ian McCarr. And that was, that's where you sit. He, he was a farm boy. Grew up on a farm, and uh, I think he paid his way through um, Ontario Agricultural College, a Bachelor of Science degree, and then a Master's degree. And he graduated and worked with the college in doing land inventory and grading for various uses. And that's where his claim to fame is. And in the province of Ontario, the Ontario Agricultural College is kind of the, the bedrock institution for which ecological land use planning sort of emerged. That's where the conservation authority movement began. And and uh, and most of the main figures that have been involved in environmental planning have come through that agricultural program. And the notion of agricultural extension workers within farm communities is the kind of model that he faced that he used, only he used that approach with respect to forestry, uh, 
parks development, agriculture, and the like. Um, he's recognized, though, not so much for that work, but for the work that he did in planning. And uh, he undertook several studies for the province of Ontario during the regional government days in the 70s that supported some of the efforts that were taking place. And the uh, Indian Society of, of Landscape Architects made him an honorary member at that time. And, and the work that he he's most known for is this paper, which was published in the first edition of the, of the journal Landscape. Who's the audience for this paper? Usual suspects, uh, landscape architects, supply geographers, regional planners, resource managers. It's also conscious of the argument that's out there that Lynn White popularized uh, with respect to the Dominion uh, concept of the uh, Verde Genesis as being uh, a problem in terms of environmental management. And he's also um, knows of the work that Francis Schaeffer is doing. But what I want to do is suggest that he's also looking at something else, and it's encapsulized in the quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we are either otherworldly or we are secularists, but in either case, uh, we no longer believe in God's kingdom. What I think Angus is trying to do, he's, he's taking the concept that Christ is in all things, and all things have their being in Christ. And what he's doing is using his transactional analysis to begin to understand what that would mean. So in that sense, he's not getting involved in this argument that Lynn White and Francis Schaeffer are involved in. Rather, he's moving it to another level and thinking about what does this really mean to be in Christ and what do, how his transactions help us to interpret what that would mean. What Hills is saying is there's a type of action needed to halt the forces of deterioration, and, and that's prime focus for why he's writing this paper. But he's also upset with Ian McCarg. At the lecture that he attended with Ian, he was quite upset with the comments that Ian made about it. And it's unfortunate in my mind that he never approached Ian and spoke to him directly, because I know from speaking to Ian when he reviewed the work that I did at the uh, Escarpment Commission that Ian held Angus's work in high regard and used it. And he would have appreciated that sort of conversation. So in a sense, I helped create, finish that loop by providing him, Ian, with the paper that Angus uh, had written. A couple of things, observations I want to make about this paper, even though it's, it's central to his work, he doesn't rely on the most recognized work that he did work that got him recognized by the uh, Canadian Society of Landscape Architects. He also doesn't draw much on his considerable planning experience. He, he looks at the work that Paul Davidoff was doing in, in Boston, and he misinterprets Paul's work, because Paul's work was very much involved with involving African Americans in municipal government decision making. And he just misses that whole point entirely. He was also concerned about scientists Whatever he's doing, he's not doing a number of It's not add and subtract. It's, it's interpretation and intuition. So instead, he focuses on this transactions, this concept of transactions, and he adapts a form of neo-Calvinism that was available to him from friends that he knew in the city of Toronto, and he tries to put together this philosophical paper. I think he had the basic structure of this philosophy available before him, and like what he does with a lot of other authors he relies on, he picks what he wants and leaves what he doesn't want. And he thinks of landscapes as transactional spaces. A transaction is a special kind of interaction which is conditioned not by the nature of the two features in apparent interaction, by the nature of most, if not all, of the interacting features in the whole ecosystem. Looking at associations and thinking of them as transactions and thinking of them within the context of all the other interactions that are taking place. This is uh, all the other pictures I've been showing of landscapes up to this point have been on the Crawford Lake. This is not a Crawford Lake, this is of the uh, Burlington Strip, each strip in between Hamilton Harbor and Lake Ontario. 
you came by Carbs through Buffalo, you cross over the Skyway Bridge, that's the speed strip. If you're flying out of Pearson on your way back to wherever, the fuel that uh, will fuel your plane will come through a pipeline under this speed strip of Nanico to the airport. Uh, in the early, late 1800s, early turn of the century, 1910, thereabouts, this was a prime cottage area because it's, it's a beach strip, sandy, separates Lake Ontario, just a wonderful place to be. Uh, with the industrialization of the city, it became less attractive. As the lake levels rose, it became less even more. And, uh, uh, you know, you went through a couple of phases of, of coming and going in there. And I might also say, too, that if you're sitting there, you're downwind, standing there on that feature downwind from the industrial factories in, in Hamilton. You're breathing air that contains benzoyl which the health risk of is equivalent to, to uh, smoking two cigarettes a day. So you're unsettled. There's a lot of stuff we don't know, and Ian or Angus didn't know that, and Angus is intuiting how these things would look. What would intuition look like? Perhaps like a farmer thinking about what to plant in the field. That's right. Um, He's got a problem with this approach, and there's a sense that uh, uh, he's, a, he's adopted the objectification and separation of body and soul and the other hierarchies that are implicit in cosmology. And he's missed the point that, and he adds this in his, in his final paper, that animals and plants feel the ecosystem to their sense organism. That is, they are sentient agents in and of them all in and of themselves. And he misses that, and that's consistent with, uh, with what, he's, what he's trying to do. Um, there is, I think I'll just move on from there. Actually, no, I'm going to kind of finish it up right here. In the notion of transaction that he is pursuing, what he's trying to do is enfold himself into the landscape, and at the same time, the landscape is unfolding itself to him. And the metaphysics that he's attempting to do is a kind of landscape embodiment. How do we fit into God's realm? How do we fit into God's realm? How do we interact with all the other elements that are functioning in God's realm? And the concept is, he has kind of two streams thing. You, you adopt either his Christology and his approach, or you just adopt the method that he's approaching. And I think he's implicit in his idea. He has a notion that Landscapes can lead you to Christ in and of that unfold. <laughs> Intimacy, that's proper lake. Light shining through the leaves, a pattern on the, uh, on the forest floor. It takes the form of a kind of tessera, landscape tiles. He was very much uh, felt intimately interlinked with the landscapes in which he was working. But what he missed was other ways of looking at it. And what I've done is put down, I worked with Aboriginal communities for quite some time and, uh, and listened to elders talk about their traditional practices and understanding of the landscape. And what I've done is I've taken two quotes, one from uh, Richard Wagamese, he's passed away now. Indian Horse was his most famous book. It's been uh, filmed into a movie. You can see it on that place, see for one. What it takes to walk is a what it takes is a walk upon the land, learning to see these things that exist there with something other than your eyes, leaving the material trappings behind a while and allowing yourself to become part of the sweep of the grandeur of the planet along your heartbeat. I'm suggesting to you today that that's no different than the verses one to four from Psalm 19, which I've quoted a while. I would suggest today that when we approach the landscape, we approach scripture, we miss that. We need to put that back into our thinking. Agency, too, if a, if a bird or tree is sentient, then it has agency in a landscape. I want to just uh, finish with this uh, 
because I was asked to at Bear Skin Lake to go up river, at Severn River is in northwestern Ontario, to look at a proposed hydro site. And I came back, and this is the bend of the river that we came around. Just a remarkable site. It's a member of, uh, of the year just before freeze up. I want to put to this point too, but climate warming, we are all communal living agents seeking a little space in God's realm. That's why Angus's work is so important to us today that we think about it and take what we can and move ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to give you an example of that picture on the left of living close to nature, uh, the natural God, the way God made it. I live in Bedford, New Hampshire, and it's a community that used to be uh, dairy farmers. And I live on Jenkins Road, and I swear to you, it must have been a cow path. The word fall off curbs. I don't understand all of them. I just I drive a mile up to the main road, and it's one curve after another. Of course, the up and down is. What? Well, you know, could you care to comment? I mean, personally, uh, a straight road and lean out in squares on the right hand of your picture, to me, is better for finding your way around than a bunch of cow paths. And that's how Bedford, New Hampshire, with its now residential, but mostly was, was uh, uh, laid out. The convenience of traveling, it's better to have it laid out and straight and in squares, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, it's nice to live in the country with the curvy <laughs> roads. <laughs> I'm going to give you a simple and short answer, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> when you mention that elements of the landscape can be sentient, can you go into a little bit more detail what you mean by sentience in, the, in those situations? I think... Um, I'm going to refer to scripture you know, in the first chapter of Genesis, and you read the creation story there. I see God commissioning the earth, the waters, vegetation, other elements that we take for granted in the landscape with certain roles to play in creation itself. I don't see it as, as mankind and a physical construct that includes species. I see God's commission to other elements to perform certain functions within creation itself. What I'm saying to you is I think that Ian, or uh, Angus, understood that, and what he was trying to do was incorporate that into his understanding of transactions. I think what he did was when he went, he, he, come, I, he comes from a, a Baptist background, I think. I never spoke to Ian about, or Angus about his, uh, his, uh, his religious community. All I know is that he appeared in front of me at a prayer and praise session, not unlike the one we just had. And, and our connection was our faith. And, and, but I think that what Angus was trying to do was try to create a system where he could understand and incorporate that, that basic sort of function, that functions that, that the creator assigned to other elements of the landscape in the creation story. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Let's take our speaker. <laughs>